Good morning. My name is Corey Arnold, and I'm the Minister of Youth here at Grace Bible Fellowship Church. I have a few announcements to share with you. We will be transitioning from a recorded service like this one to live streaming our 1030 a.m. in-person worship service. We hope to have that transition fully completed for next Sunday, June the 14th. Barring any technological setbacks, the 10.30 a.m. in-person service will be available on the church website starting today, June the 7th. Our plan is to do a trial run of the stream before we make the full transition. If you are unable to join the 9 a.m. or 10.30 a.m. in-person services, please check out the live stream starting at 10.30 a.m. If you have any questions about the transition to live streaming, please contact the church office. Fireside Chats will continue this week on Tuesday and Friday, along with the Wednesday virtual prayer meeting. Please remove any distractions so we can worship our great God. The call to worship this morning is Psalm 34, verses 1 through 3. Please follow along as I read. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, you alone are worthy of all our praises. Yet you love us so much to adopt us as your children to receive the inheritance of your heavenly kingdom. Lord, humble our hearts and minds as we worship you. Allow us to bring glorious praise to your name. Amen. Good morning, I'm Tim Radcliffe, the assistant pastor here at Grace Bible Fellowship. Our scripture reading for this morning is from Psalm 122. I invite you to turn in that passage. We'll be reading all of Psalm 122 together, verses 1 through verse 9. Would you follow along as I read? Psalm 122, a song of ascents of David. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem, built as a city that is bound firmly together, to which the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, as was decreed for Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord. There, thrones for judgment were set, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. Peace be within your walls, and security within your towers. For my brothers and companions' sake, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord, our God, I will seek your good. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, and, and we are a thankful people. We are glad, glad to be able to, to join together, some of our local congregation, even together in person this morning. Like we have just read, we are glad when it is said to us, let us go to the house of the Lord. It is a good place to be. We are thankful for, for more than just this gathering, though. We are, we are thankful that you have come down to us. You have revealed yourself to us. You have revealed yourself to us through your word and, and through your spirit. We are thankful that you receive our worship, not only when we are gathered together here in this building, but but every time we come to you and we come to, to hear your word and to, to lift our voices in praise, you hear our worship. And so we are thankful to you. Lord, we, we come to you now and we know that it has been a difficult time. We know that we have been separated as, as brothers and sisters in Christ from meeting for, for many weeks. And, and we know that this local congregation at least will not be fully back together again for, for weeks to come. We are, we are grateful that we can worship together, whether that's in, in person or, or online, we can be worshiping together in spirit and in truth, but, but Lord, it is difficult for us as we come together and, and we know that we have been missing the fellowship of your people. We think of, of our dear brothers and sisters 
who have been going through even more trials than, than simply missing church services, those who have been sick, those who are continuing to face physical trials and, and emotional pressures. We think especially of those who have, who have lost family members during this time. Lord, we pray that you would come and, and you, would, you would bring healing. We pray that you would come and bring comfort to your people. We know that we are a frail people. We, we are in need of healing, both physically and, and emotionally. But Lord, we, we rest on you. We, we rest on your unfailing love and, and on the comfort and peace that, that only you can bring. The peace that, that you have promised to your people. Lord, even as, as I pray for, for peace and, and I read about it, about peace being within the walls of Jerusalem, I, I'm reminded of the unrest in our nation or the unrest surrounding race and, and violence of prejudice and politics. Lord, it is so volatile. We know that there is deep pain that exists in our nation there are those who, who have been oppressed and, and those who have experienced fear and, and prejudice throughout their lives who, who may not understand peace and security in this world. Lord, we, we pray that this would change. That all those in, in a position to help, to, to display love and, and to offer peace would do so. I pray for this church. I pray for this community Lord, that we would take the peace that we have in Christ, even the peace that, that we experience in, in our culture, and that we would share it with those who, who have none. Lord, may we, may we not only seek help through politics, may we not rely on the princes of this world. May we, we who, who share in Christ, who are your people, May we be bold and, and brave to love those who are different, to love those who are hurting, and may we do it in a, in a very real and, and very tangible way. Lord, may we listen with understanding. May we help wherever we can, however we can. As we have read in your word and, and sung with our lips this morning, we, we pray now for unity and for peace among your people, but but Lord, we pray that, that these things would not come simply to us, but that, that we then would take them to a world that is lost and suffering. So Lord, we, we rejoice that we can come to you and, and we can worship you. That you are God who is worthy of all praise and, and that you have saved us and, and you have saved our lives and, and brought us peace with you. At the same time, Lord, our, our hearts break at the world that we live in the brokenness and despair that is around us. So would you empower us, would you empower us by the Spirit to be instruments of, of grace and peace and, and of, of gospel witness here in, in our community and, and also in our world. We pray that you would do that in us and through us, and we pray it all in Christ's name. Amen. Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. What a privilege and a pleasure it is to gather around the Word of God, worshiping the great God of the Word. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we pray that you would open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts, that your Word would penetrate, that it would achieve the purposes for which you send it this day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you open your Bibles, if you're not already there, to Psalm 122. We're going to focus our attention on this morning on the psalm that our brother Tim has read for us. And it begins, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. In the English translation that I'm looking at, there is an exclamation point at the conclusion of this psalmist statement in verse 1. As I understand that it's not part of the original Hebrew language that the author David wrote and spoke in, at least not the way we understand an exclamation point, but I can assure you that this exclamation point belongs 
For for the faithful man or woman of God, there's great anticipation in gathering for public worship. It's an anticipation that for those of you who are here this morning, or even those who are, uh, who are, who are waiting to gather for worship, um, is being fulfilled. Um, those of you who are watching at home, I understand the yearning that you feel. You want to be here. The desire to worship is there, but God knows your heart, and, and might I say the desire to be worshiping together does not reach its pinnacle this morning. This is not the best for us. The best is yet to come. The best will come only when we gather together in glory, bowing before our great God and singing to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Anticipation is hardwired into all of us. When I was a child, the, the kid year revolved around a few special events. There was Christmas, certainly. But closely behind Christmas, at least for me, was the last day of school. On the last day of school, each year I would leap from the building shouting, Freedom! Sweet! Freedom! But there was a, another high point in any calendar year. It wasn't a set day on the calendar. It varied from year to year. But it was the day when my father would announce, Let's go to Dorney Park. Yippee! Let's go, let's go now, let's leave right away. Maybe for some of you, you're thinking, okay, a trip to an amusement park might not seem particularly memorable. But it was to me because we didn't go much of anywhere. And Dorney Park was, for me, kind of like making a pilgrimage. Once a year, we would go. As a child, going to Dorney Park offered this great convergence of sights and sounds and smells all of them delightful to my kid soul. There was the screams of those who were riding the roller coaster, the sights of the thrill rides and the carnival games, the smells of popcorn and fresh-made waffles. It's no wonder that my excitement built with every moment and every mile as, as we drew closer to the parking lot leading into the park. And as we walked into the park, my smile just grew wider and wider until my whole face just erupted in a show of teeth. I smiled so hard each year when I arrived. My face hurt. So now imagine the psalmist feeling when other faithful Jews said to him, let us go to the house of the Lord. He was, says it right here, he was glad. What a reminder that there's joy in worshiping God and in worshiping God together. The psalmist felt that and I, I hope we feel it too, even as we space ourselves and bear with wearing our masks. Gathering together for worship is something we long for. Whether you're worshiping at Grace Church today or waiting for that day when you feel you can safely return to church. It's the same longing. Just as the psalmist wrote, our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. We should be saying, hallelujah, our feet are once again standing in this place and we're standing before God, worshiping him alongside our brothers and sisters in Christ. Are you glad? I want to share three simple words to convey what the psalmist was expressing as he came to Jerusalem for worship. Joy, gratitude, and commitment. Joy. We see this in verses 1 and 2. I was glad when they said to me, let, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. As you look at this psalm, you immediately see a superscription that was part of the original text. In our English Bibles, we start with what, what I just read as verse 1, but what we, what we see right before verse 1 is actually how Psalm 122 begins in the Hebrew Bible. It begins with a song of ascents of David. Psalms 120 to 134 are all labeled as songs of ascent. That means they were songs composed for and either sung or recited by people of faith as they ascended, as they literally went up to Jerusalem for worship at one of three annual festivals that God had set aside for his people to commemorate together. There was Passover, there was first fruits, 
and then there was booths or tabernacles. Each of this, these three feasts represented a, a different aspect of God's care for his people. At Passover, God's deliverance. At First Fruits, God's provision. At booths or tabernacles, God's preservation of his people. On these three days, wherever you lived, whether it was near or far away or even in another country, you came to Jerusalem, if you could at all, to worship God. There was great excitement about it. You wanted to be in Jerusalem. Part of the excitement was communal. As we see in verse 1, we've made our faith too individualized. But look at the nouns in verse 1. I was glad, singular, when they said to me, plural, let us, plural, go to the house of the Lord. Because of the dangers faced along the way and because of the nature of God's people being to want to be together for worship and fellowship, this is by God's own design. It goes all the way back to Genesis 2 when, when the declaration is made, it is not good for man to be alone. Well, all of that together and in the context of worship, corporate worship in Jerusalem, families and even whole communities would travel together. Psalm 122 is one of three songs of ascent that are attributed to King David. It's also the third of the songs of ascent, and it's thought that there is a, a building up or a progression to them that conveys the growing excitement of being together as God's people, of the idea of worshiping and fellowshiping, fellowshiping together as something we should be eager to do, we should look forward to. So if you just glance over at Psalm 120 and Psalm 121, you don't have to go far. These are the psalms that directly come before Psalm 122. And in Psalm 120, Jerusalem seems so far away. There's a lament that goes out. The psalmist is actually in distress. He's far away from Jerusalem where he wants to be. We read Meshech and among the tents of Kedar, and there's a tension because he's just not where he desires to be. He's a pilgrim who hasn't even begun the journey to Jerusalem. But then you next look at Psalm 121, and it begins, I lift my eyes, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? This is written by a pilgrim on the way. He is on his pilgrimage. He's on the way, but he is concerned about what lies ahead. There are dangers along the journey. So he looks for help, and he's comforted by the fact that God is his help. We can see both of these psalms, I think, in light of what's happened over the past few weeks. At the start of the pandemic, regathering for worship just looked like a, a little tiny speck in the distance. And we didn't know when that day would come when we could be back together. But now we come to Psalm 122. And the pilgrim has arrived at his destination. He's at the right place at the right time. And what's abundantly clear is that he's at the right place at the right time with the right heart attitude. He greatly desires to be in the Lord's house. And when he arrives, his response is, my feet are standing within your gates. I can't believe I'm finally here. This is just so good. Now, we don't go to Jerusalem. We worship together as God's people in the church that he has established through and by his son, the Lord Jesus. We have even more reasons to be eager to worship together. A pastor named Ligon Duncan says, No Israelite ought to be able to give us a run for our money in gathering with the people of God to worship him because we have seen the one that all of the types and shadows of the Old Testament pointed to. We have seen the fulfillment of all the prophecies and all the promises of the Old Testament, and our zeal should exceed the zeal of those Israelites under the Old Covenant. For everything that God's Old Testament people did as they gathered for worship in Jerusalem it ultimately finds its fulfillment in our worship as the church of Jesus Christ. We have the privilege of worshiping with God's people in God's house. And it's not the building and it's not even just being together. It's the joy of coming together as those who know the joy and blessing of worshiping the God who sent his son for us. Do you feel that joy? I think the bigger question is, do you love to worship God? If you rightly understand the depth and the greatness of God's grace to you, to me, 
all that he's done to save a sinner like me and like you, if you get that, then you're going to want to come together to thank him, to praise him, and to worship him for his great grace. Have these past weeks rekindled the fire of your desire to worship God? May it be so. We so easily take public worship for granted. We can almost get to the point where we get to thinking, well, another Sunday, another church service, ho-hum. But then all of that for us was taken away. It was necessary that we stop gathering for worship so we could protect ourselves until we understood the dangers the coronavirus presented and so we could take the proper precautions. And it is still necessary for some of you to wait before returning to church for worship. But as you are experiencing, if you're watching this at home, this is something, being together is something we long for. And when it comes, whether it's today or at some future date, may we say, I am glad. It's possible to be at the right place, at the right time, but without the right heart. If you lose sight of God's great grace, you lose your desire to worship. You'll be like the mother who came to her son one day and, and as he lay there in bed said, it's time to get up for church. And he just rolled over and pulled the covers up over his head. I don't want to go to church today. The people there don't like me. They won't talk to me. Everyone's unkind to me. I'm not going. Just give me one reason why I need to go to church. Her answer, you're the pastor. You need to get up and go to church. Stephen Lawson says it does no good to be at the right place at the right time if you do not have the right heart. So see the psalmist's heart. He says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And that word glad in Hebrew, it conveys rejoicing. It conveys delight, gladness, even laughter, a merriness that is connected with going to the house of the Lord. But the psalmist's joy is not focused so much on the place of worship, but on the person he worships. He loves to worship God. And so when others say, let us go to the house of the Lord so we can worship, he gets excited. Let's go. That's what it means to have the right heart. What makes the psalmist glad about going to the house of the Lord? Well, the same things that should make us glad Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. This is the place where we hear God's word preached and taught. There's delight in hearing from God, from hearing God's word. This is early, in Psalm 122 appears early in Jerusalem's history as Israel's center for worship. David didn't build the temple, Solomon, his son, did. So when David wrote Psalm 122, the center for the worship of God was the tabernacle. It was, it was a movable tent, but God's presence was there. And so going up to Jerusalem to worship was fresh. It was a delight to go to the temple, uh, to the tabernacle, where you would hear the word of God, the revelation of God through his proclaimed word. Well, there's, there's also the joy of worshiping God along with his people. That's a desire that we heard expressed in, in our call to worship this morning from Psalm 34. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. There in Psalm 34, the psalmist expresses the delight of being together both for worship and for fellowship. I think many of us have felt these last weeks like the writer of Psalm 42 as a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? And just as the psalmist comforted himself in Psalm 42 with the words, Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. We comfort ourselves with the assurance that we will worship together, whether today or in the future, and certainly as we bow before God in his eternal kingdom and glory. Attitude, which we see in verses 3 through 5. Jerusalem, built as a city that is bound firmly together, to which the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord. 
as was decreed for Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord. Their thrones for judgment were set, the thrones of the house of David. There are things that make the psalmist a grateful worshiper, things that he only fully grasps once he's arrived in Jerusalem, and things that should cause gratitude to rise up in us, too, as we gather for worship. The psalmist specifically in these verses mentions two things for which he's grateful, even as he just marvels at the joy of having arrived here in the city. He is grateful for, first for unity. When David wrote this psalm, Jerusalem was still a pretty compact place, and everything was centered on the worship at the tabernacle. Worship is the central focus at this time in Jerusalem. And David writes about all the tribes going up, the tribes of the Lord. And they're going at God's command. And they come from everywhere, both Israel and abroad. Israel has 12 tribes. They don't all look the same. They don't all have the same accent. But the, psalm, the psalmist, he marvels as all of this diversity gathers together for worship. It is a marvelous thing, this family of God, all united because we are in Christ Jesus. Are you grateful that we aren't all alike, but we're all one in Christ? I love that about the body of Christ. You can go anywhere in the world and you will find fellow Christians. We can be separated by culture, separated by language, but we share a common faith and a common savior and this unity in diversity for which the psalmist is grateful is just a, a prefiguring of what heaven is going to be like as every tribe and tongue is represented all of us gathering around our great savior worshiping together for eternity shouldn't we get a start on that now why do we have to wait for then we can be active in pursuing this unity that we share there's a second thing that the psalmist is grateful for as he arrives in Jerusalem. He's grateful for justice. Jerusalem is where justice was enacted. Quite likely he couldn't get full justice elsewhere, but he, it was found here where the king ruled. Perhaps he's even referencing a very visual picture. Since justice was often provided at a city's gates, the thrones for judgment might have been right at Jerusalem's entrance, and he saw it as he arrived. But what the psalmist is most grateful for is that in the Lord's house, right is rewarded and wrong is punished. People are treated fairly, and that is what the church is to be. It's not perfect, for the church is still filled with sinners. But this is to be a place where we can know and share love and fairness and justice and forgiveness and genuine compassion and care with the promise that when Jesus returns, the words of Amos 5, verse 24, will be fulfilled. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. As you come here this morning, are, are you grateful? Or as you sit home, even waiting for the opportunity to be together, but still worshiping God, the church doesn't close for you, despite the fact that you're not physically present. You're still worshiping. Are you, are you grateful? What fills your heart with gratitude? We shouldn't need prompts to express our gratitude. You know, in 1 Corinthians 4, Paul had to chide the Corinthians into gratitude by writing, what do you have that you did not receive? Think about that. Everything we have, everything we have comes from him. Stephen Lawson says, just think of what you would be if it wasn't for Christ. What would your life be like? What would you be without Christ? Where would you be without him? What would you be doing without Christ? You'd be lost. You'd be blind. You'd be deaf. You'd be dumb. You'd be dead in your sins. You'd be living for your job. You'd be living for sports. You'd be living for the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. Instead, you're here. And you're clothed in the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. And God has saved you. You are a new creature in Jesus Christ. I think we all ought to be grateful. Gratitude should be part of who we are. Commitment. As the psalmist stands within Jerusalem's gates, the 
his third and final expressed emotion, even if it's not officially an emotion, an emotion, but he feels a sense of commitment. He calls others to it, and he promises to engage in it himself. As he writes, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For my brothers and companions' sake, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. The psalmist is committed to the peace of Jerusalem. Now that's a, a, a term that we've most of us heard before. And whenever we hear it, it's usually stated in conjunction with what's going on in the Middle East. Pray that there will be peace between Jews and Muslims. I believe that's a prayer that we can and should pray for, believing that only God can bring it about. I can't help, though, but think of the unrest that has spread throughout our nation and the world these past two weeks as protests have erupted, some of them peaceful, some of them violent, in our cities and even in towns like Quakertown. What should be sought by all of us is peace through understanding, as we wrestle with the age-old question of racism. As Christians, God has called us to be peacemakers. And he desires that all people of all races would come to ultimately know peace, the peace that comes from knowing the Prince of Peace, the Lord Jesus. We need to step away from politics and embrace understanding. As followers of Jesus, we need to seek the good, not just of people who are exactly like us, but of those who are very different from us. We're commanded to bear witness to the glorious gospel. It's a gospel which produces peace. It produces, first of all, what we need most, peace between man and God. But it also produces peace between man and man, not just in our Jerusalems and in our Judeas, but in Samaria and even to the end of the earth. If we're going to be peacemakers, church needs to be, be a place where it starts. The church needs to be a place where, as the people of God, we take the lead in reaching out in love, compassion, and peace to those who are not like us. They need the gospel, too. And they need to be brought into the church and welcomed among us as brothers and sisters. If you look at verse 6, you see that David is actually using a play on word. When you see that word peace, it's the word shalom. Literally, he writes, pray for the shalom of Jerusalem. Jerusalem means king of peace or foundation of peace. Could it be, say, could it be that David is saying, Pray that you experience the shalom of Jerusalem. Pray that you experience the peace that followers of God know because they're worshipers of the one true God. We know peace. We only know peace because of what Jesus has done. And we as the church need to both protect that peace and promote that peace. As the psalmist worships in Jerusalem, he wants others to know the peace he knows. The psalmist is committed to praying that the peace he knows as he worships in the Lord's house will be protected and strengthened, that it will spread. He pleads with others to pray for this peace, and he declares his intention to commit himself to protecting and furthering peace. Brothers and sisters, let us commit to praying that others will know the same peace God has provided for us through his Son. Let's pray that the church will be a place where peace is prevalent. When we love the church, we want it to prosper in this way. And essentially, that's what the psalmist is asking for and is committed to when he writes, may they be secure who love you. The meaning is, may they prosper who love you. The psalmist is praying for the prosperity of God's people. And so we pray for peace in the church. We pray that the church would project peace to a world that is filled with disquiet. We need to pray for this kind of peace, and then we need to be active in promoting it. On our church websites, Fridays have been reserved for fireside chats on the Beatitudes. Not coincidentally, there is no such thing. This past Friday, we were in Matthew 5, verse 9, which reads, I couldn't, I couldn't do this. I could not arrange this. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. 
to be a son, as it's understood here, as Jesus proclaims it in the Sermon on the Mount. To be a son is to be the reflection of a father, especially in the realm of character. When the church works to promote peace, especially the peace brought about by the gospel, we reflect the character of God the Father who gave his son to be the peace that the world needs and to provide the salvation that, that supplies peace and produces peace. Do you love God? If you've tasted of his grace, you will experience the joy, gratitude, and commitment that we have read about this morning. To love God is to love worship and to love fellowship with his people. This kind of love produces action as well as anticipation that is realized when we come together. And when we come together, whether it's today or in weeks to come, may we all say, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Is that the desire of your heart? I hope so. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your your word, it is so powerful, it is so convicting. There were things here, Lord, even as I prepared to proclaim your word that, that I, I was convicted about. There are things that I need to change, areas I need to grow in, and I trust that'll be true for everyone. And we know it will be true because your word goes out with purpose and the, the, the response to your word is not just to say, oh, I like that, that was entertaining, but uh, there's something that you want me to do. Your word has to go deep in us and it always achieves the purposes for which you send it. So Lord, help us to, to, to be enthusiastic about being your people to be grateful for all you have done for us, to desire to worship and, teaching on, and sit under the teaching of your word and, and to enjoy the fellowship that we have as the church, as brothers and sisters. Then, Lord, help us to share the commitments that you so clearly declare in your word. Specifically this morning, we were reminded that we are to be peacemakers. The church is to take the lead in promoting peace. May we do that. May we do it not in our own strength because we have none. We are inadequate, but, but we can do all things through the one who strengthens us. So may we get to work and may we be a help, not a hindrance. Lord, we look forward to being together again by your grace and for your glory. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And now the benediction. May the Lord your God our help in ages past, and our hope for years to come. May he be your guard while troubles last and lead you to his eternal throne. Amen and amen. God be with you.